There were some present at that very time who told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And he answered them, Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered in this way? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Or those eighteen on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them, do you think that they were worse offenders than all the others who lived in Jerusalem? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. And he told this parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came seeking fruit on it, and found none. And he said to the vine dresser, Look, for three years now I have come seeking fruit on this fig tree, and I find none. Cut it down. Why should it use up the ground? And he answered him, Sir, let it alone this year also, until I dig around it and put on manure. Then if it should bear fruit next year, well and good. But if not, you can cut it down. Now he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. And behold, there was a woman who had had a disabling spirit for 18 years. She was bent over and could not fully straighten herself. When Jesus saw her, he called her over and said to her, Woman, you are freed from your disability. And he laid his hands on her, and immediately she was made straight, and she glorified God.
But the ruler of the synagogue, indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, said to the people, There are six days in which work ought to be done. Come on those days and be healed, and not on the Sabbath day. Then the Lord answered him, You hypocrites! Does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey from the manger and lead it away to water it? And ought not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan bound for eighteen years, be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath day? As he said these things, all his adversaries were put to shame, and all the people rejoiced at all the glorious things that were done by him. He said, therefore, What is the kingdom of God like, and to what shall I compare it? It is like a grain of mustard seed that a man took and sowed in his garden, and it grew and became a tree, and the birds of the air made nests in its branches. And once again he said, To what shall I compare the kingdom of God? It is like leaven that a woman took and hid in three measures of flour until it was all leavened. He went on his way through towns and villages, teaching and journeying toward Jerusalem. And someone said to him, Lord, will those who are saved be few? And he said to them, Strive to enter through the narrow door, for many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able. When once the master of the house has risen and shut the door, and you begin to stand outside and to knock at the door, saying, Lord, open to us, then he will answer you, I do not know where you come from. Then you will begin to say, We ate and drank in your presence, and you taught in our streets. But he will say, I tell you, I do not know where you come from. Depart from me, all you workers of evil. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth when you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, but you yourselves cast out. And people will come from east and west and from north and south and recline at table in the kingdom of God. And behold, some are last who will be first, and some are first who will be last. At that very hour, some Pharisees came and said to him, Get away from here, for Herod wants to kill you. And he said to them, Go and tell that fox, Behold, I cast out demons and perform cures today and tomorrow, and the third day I finish my course. Nevertheless, I must go on my way today and tomorrow and the day following for it cannot be that a prophet should perish away from Jerusalem. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you were not willing. Behold, your house is forsaken, and I tell you, you will not see me until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Luke 13, verse 1. There were some present at that very time who told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And he answered them, Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans? because they suffered in this way? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Or those 18 on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them, do you think that they were worse offenders than all the others who lived in Jerusalem? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. 
and he told this parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came seeking fruit on it and found none. And he said to the vine dresser, Look, for three years now I have come seeking fruit on this fig tree, and I find none. Cut it down. Why should it use up the ground? And he answered him, Sir, let it alone this year also, until I dig around it and put on manure. Then if it should bear fruit next year, well and good. But if not, you can cut it down. Now he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. And behold, there was a woman who had had a disabling spirit for eighteen years. She was bent over and could not fully straighten herself. When she saw her, he called her over and said to her, Woman, you are freed from your disability. And he laid his hand on her, and immediately she was made straight, and she glorified God. But the ruler of the synagogue, indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, said to the people, There are six days in which work ought to be done. Come on those days and be healed, and not on the Sabbath day. Then the Lord answered him, You hypocrites! Does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey from the manger and lead it away to water it? And ought not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan bound for eighteen years, be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath day? As he said these things, all his adversaries were put to shame, and all the people rejoiced at all the glorious things that were done by him. He said, therefore, What is the kingdom of God like? And to what shall I compare it? It is like a grain of mustard seed that a man took and sowed in his garden. And it grew and became a tree, and the birds of the air made nests in its branches. And again he said, To what shall I compare the kingdom of God? It is like leaven that a woman took and hid in three measures of flour until it was all leavened. He went on his way through towns and villages, teaching and journeying towards Jerusalem. And someone said to him, Lord, will those who are saved be few? And he said to them, Strive to enter through the narrow door. For many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able. When once the master of the house has risen and shut the door, and you begin to stand outside and to knock at the door, saying, Lord, open to us. Then he will answer you, I do not know where you come from. Then you will begin to say, We ate and drank in your presence, and you taught in our streets. But he will say, I tell you, I do not know where you come from. Depart from me, all you workers of evil. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth when you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, but you yourselves cast out. And people will come from east and west and from north and south and recline at table in the kingdom of God. And behold, some are last who will be first and some are first who will be last. At that very hour, some Pharisees came and said to him, Get away from here, for Herod wants to kill you. And he said to them, Go and tell that fox, Behold, I cast out demons and perform cures today and tomorrow, and the third day I finish my course. Nevertheless, I must go on my way today and tomorrow and the following day, for it cannot be that a prophet should perish away from Jerusalem. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you were not willing. Behold, your house is forsaken, and I tell you, you will not see me until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The 13th chapter of Luke begins a section in which Luke is going to describe for us the nature of the kingdom of God. Jesus is going to teach us what the kingdom of God is like and who belongs in God's kingdom. The first verse begins with a tragic event. Pilate, 
was not known for his kindness or tolerance. We do not have a specific record of this event in history. Some Galileans had come to offer sacrifices. Pilate ordered his Roman soldiers to go to where these Galileans were gathering, bringing their sacrifices, and slaughter them. To add insult to all of this, then their blood was mixed with the blood of the animals that were to be sacrificed. Massacre and desecration all in one moment. Some people come to Jesus to tell him about this horrible event. Jesus uses this event to teach a number of important spiritual truths. From this text, what we see is that God does not directly use tragedy to judge us for our sins. Now notice how Jesus deals with what it seems the people were implying. These Galileans must have been some sort of wicked people for this awful massacre to have happened to them. Jesus completely disagrees with their assessment. Jesus asks, do you think? that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered in this way? Jesus' answer is no. No, they were not worse sinners. This event did not happen because they were more sinful than other Galileans. In verse 4, Jesus uses another tragic event to prove his point. Were the people who died from a tower falling on them worse offenders than all the others who lived in Jerusalem? Jesus' answer is again no. It was common for the Jews to attribute disaster directly to sins. When you read Job 4, you'll notice that the three friends of Job declare the reason that Job is suffering is because of his sins. He's a bad man, and you do good, get good, do bad, get bad. In John 9, verses 1-3, through 3, even Jesus' disciples ask who sinned for this man to be born blind, himself or his parents. They believe that suffering was directly tied to sinfulness. We fall into the same trap. And we even see such false declarations in the religious world around us. Remember when Hurricane Katrina hit New Orleans? Some people decided that it was because of the sins of that city. Or when 9-11 happened, that God was attacking Wall Street, the root of all evil in America. Do you see Jesus' answer to this? Do you really think that these people are worse sinners than all the others for such an event to happen? For anyone to suggest that a person who experiences tragedy is a worse sinner is to be completely ignorant of the scriptures. I mean, just think about it. What sins did Jesus commit for him to suffer the way that he did? The scriptures are clear that he did nothing to deserve that suffering. Were the apostles worse sinners such that they were systematically hunted down and killed? Was Job a worse sinner so that all his children were killed? God is not singling people out and punishing them for their sins. These are words of comfort that, that I need to hear also. When we learned that our daughter was born with a disability. I wondered if it was some kind of punishment for my sins. What, did, what had I done wrong for this to happen? And the answer is that I've done all kinds of things that are wrong. I am a sinner before the Lord, but that is not the reason why she was born with a disability. This is not the reason why my house burned down. This is not the reason why I had a flat tire on the road. God is not karma. That's probably the most profound thing that you'll hear me say today. God is not karma. We must rid ourselves of the false notion that good things only happen to good people and bad things only happen to bad people. We see good things happen to bad people all the time. We see bad things happen to good people all the time. Now, we certainly experience consequences for our sinful decisions. If I decide to run off with another woman, then I must expect the consequences of the destruction of my family. But calamities, sicknesses, and disasters are not from the hand of God. Now, think about this logically. If your children disobey you, you don't go about trying to sabotage their lives or kill them, do you? God is our Father, who is the perfect parent, who perfectly loves us. It is not his desire to destroy us. Now notice how Jesus defeats this argument. We are all sinners equally. No one stands guiltless before God. All of us deserve punishment. Jesus turns the tables on these people who told him about this event. We are not any better than those who have perished under such tragedies. In fact, God's judgment will come on each of us if we do not repent. Jesus turns the direction of the discussion. God is not going to kill you on the spot for committing sins. But understand an important truth. 
you will be judged if you do not repent. God does not need to bring physical death to us for our sins because all of us are worthy of spiritual death. And that day of judgment is coming. God has appointed the day of judgment. All sinners face the same fate before God. Everyone must stand before Him in judgment and will be called into account the things we have done which while we have lived. If God is going to start killing people because of their sins, there wouldn't be a person left on this earth, would there? In verses 6 through 9, Jesus tells a parable to help motivate the people towards repentance. The parable is about a man who plants a fig tree, but the fig tree continues to not bear fruit. Now, this was a common description given by the prophets concerning the nation of Israel. You see here on the screen, Hosea 9, verse 10, Micah 7, verse 1, Jeremiah 8, verse 13. If you want, pause and you can read those. Israel was a fig tree that had borne no fruit and was worthy of judgment. Notice this is what the parable teaches. The man with the fig tree says the tree has not borne fruit for three years. Therefore, cut it down because it's wasting the ground. The vine dresser responds, give it one more year. He will dig around it. He'll put fertilizer on it. He'll see if it bears fruit next year. If it does not, then cut it down. The first message that Jesus wants us to learn is that the graciousness of God God does not want to bring judgment against the nation of Israel. In the parable, one more year is given to see if the tree will now bear fruit. The point was that the tree did not deserve to continue because of its lack of fruit. The nation of Israel was deserving of immediate judgment. However, God was allowing more time for them to repent. And the same gracious message is given to us today. God continues to be patient, not wanting any to perish, but that all should reach repentance. One of God's great graces that we must appreciate is His giving of more time. God gives more time to try to save more people. Also notice the call to repent before it is too late. Now consider the two stories in the text. These people went to worship God, and they did not know that that day would be their last. The 18 who died at the Tower of Siloam did not know it would be the last day that they would live. Repent today. Give your heart and live for Jesus today. Our God is looking for fruit that shows our repentance. Otherwise, we'll be uprooted and cast away into eternal punishment on the day of judgment. In verse 10, Jesus is teaching the synagogue on one of the Sabbath days. The Jews would gather various synagogues on the seventh day of the week in the first century where they would pray, they would sing, they would listen to the reading of the scriptures. In the synagogue is a woman who has been bent over for 18 years and could not straighten herself up. Now imagine the scene as this woman walks into the synagogue. Verse 12 says that Jesus saw her and called her over. And Jesus said to her, Woman, you are free from your disability. Then, laying hands on her, she was immediately made straight. Then she began glorifying God in the midst of the synagogue. What a great event! And what a great miracle to happen in the midst of the synagogue. This would be similar to someone having a disability on the Lord's Day, and Jesus comes in and heals that person. How exciting. This should have propelled the worship that day. This miracle should have intensified their prayers, their songs, and their spiritual readings. However, the leaders of the synagogue become indignant with Jesus because he healed on the Sabbath day. How dare he? The Jews considered healing a work, and you are not supposed to work on the Sabbath day. We just wrap your mind around that. Healing is a work. Healing. He healed her. It's a work. Not supposed to do that on the Sabbath day. While the Jewish people were not to work on the Sabbath, they had imposed ridiculous human rules such that they are upset when the hand of God moved on the Sabbath day. We can understand why Jesus becomes upset when he sees this kind of reaction. Other than praising God, the synagogue leader is indignant. Jesus calls them hypocrites. You'll untie your oxen or your donkey so they can drink water, but you cannot be joyful over the healing of this disabled woman? In a moment, we're going to tie the meaning of this event to the parable that Jesus tells. But before we can observe the parable, we need to see the meaning of the miracle and what it means in terms of the kingdom. There are three things that I think you should notice in this miracle and its explanation. First, Luke does not simply state this woman is disabled. Notice that she has a disabling spirit. Now, this does not mean that she was demon-possessed necessarily, but she has been directly afflicted by Satan. Number two, notice that Jesus says that she has been bound for Satan for 18 years. The problem has been for a long time. 
and, he says, this is the daughter of Abraham. Luke is putting pieces together for us that we must not fly by without first contemplating this. Verse 16 is teaching us something very crucial about the kingdom. This woman is a daughter of Abraham. She is part of God's covenant family, but she has been bound by Satan for 18 years. Now carefully notice the language in this verse. Look at verse 16. What did Jesus say happened? She was loosed from the bonds on the Sabbath day. She'd been released from her enslavement. Let me just look back in verse 12. What did Jesus say happened? She had been set free. Through Jesus, this woman has been freed from her bondage. This is why Jesus calls them hypocrites. They have failed to see what has just happened. They have failed to see the significance of this event. They will set their ox or their donkey free to lead to water, but cannot see that this woman has been set free from Satan. In this miracle, we are seeing that Jesus is fighting Satan. Satan has people in his grasp. Satan has directly afflicted people. And this disability was a visualization of that truth. Jesus is fighting Satan and winning. Eighteen years have passed, and this woman could not be set free. There was nothing she could do to break free from Satan's grasp. There was nothing others could do for her to release her from her slavery. This truth reveals the great power of Satan. But there is one that is greater, isn't there? Jesus has come, and he's fighting against Satan and winning. Jesus' healing shows the collapse of Satan's power over people. The leader of the synagogue is not seeing the great winning of the war. Jesus is battling and beating Satan. Further, the Abraham promise is being fulfilled. It is notable that this woman is called a daughter of Abraham. Luke is calling to mind the promise that God made to Abraham that the nations were going to be blessed. A deliverer would come and set the world free. The healing shows that freedom has come to the world through Jesus. But Jesus is not done. Please notice a key word in verse 18. Therefore, the parable he tells is an explanation of the event that has just happened. Jesus is telling this parable in direct connection to this woman's healing. Notice how Jesus begins this parable. What is the kingdom of God like? That's the theme of this in the next few chapters in Luke. Luke chapter 13 through 18. We're reading about what the kingdom of God is like. Who is in this kingdom? What is the nature of this kingdom? Luke is no longer explaining who Jesus is, but who is in the kingdom and what the kingdom is like. The first parable is the parable of the mustard seed that is planted in a garden. The seed grew, became a tree, and the birds made nests in its branches. There are two points in this parable that Jesus teaches us about the kingdom. First, the kingdom will begin small, but will experience immense growth. It will begin as a small seed will turn into a tree. Secondly, the kingdom will provide rest and comfort to all peoples. Not only is this kingdom pictured as a great tree, but as a tree that provides shade and shelter for the birds. This image is the fulfillment of Ezekiel's prophecy. Over in Ezekiel chapter 17, listen to what Ezekiel says, beginning in verse 22. Thus says the Lord God, I myself will take a sprig from the lofty top of the cedar and will set it out. I will break off from the topmost of its young twigs a tender one, and I myself will plant it on a high and lofty mountain. On the mountain height of Israel will I plant it, that it may bear branches and produce fruit and become a noble cedar, and under it will dwell every kind of bird. In the shade of its branches birds of every sort will nest, and all the trees of the field shall know that I am the Lord. I bring low the high tree and make high the low tree, dry up the green tree and make the dry tree flourish. I am the Lord. I have spoken. I will do it. The context of Ezekiel 17 is the destruction of Israel for their sins and the covenant breaking. But there is this prophecy of hope that God will take a little twig from the tree and plant it. It will become a greater tree and bear fruit. All the birds will rest in its trees. The kingdom of God is a pleasant place to dwell and protects those who live under its shade. All peoples from all over the globe can come into this kingdom to find rest, comfort, and protection. Now the final point comes from the parable of the leaven, that a woman hid in three measures of flour until it was all leavened. What is beginning small is going to permeate the world. What appears to be tiny and insignificant will prove to have been the beginning of God's mighty kingdom. The rule and reign of God has returned visibly in this miracle. 
Jesus is battling Satan and winning. The shackles that Satan has on people is being released. God has returned to his people. This woman and her healing is the visible sign that the children of Abraham are being set free from Satan's power. How dare the religious of the day cry foul when God is battling Satan's rule and is displaying his victory through this woman. The Sabbath is the perfect day for this healing, battling Satan and setting this woman free. Remember the command purpose of the Sabbath? In Deuteronomy 5 and verse 15, you shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out from there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore the Lord your God will command you to keep the Sabbath day. The Sabbath was to be a reminder that they were slaves in Egypt. The Sabbath is the perfect day for setting the children of Abraham free from Satan. This was the day the people of Israel to remember that they were enslaved in Egypt and had been set free from God. Therefore these people are hypocrites for not understanding the meaning of the freedom in the miracle. How dare the leaders of the synagogue say that this should have been done on another day but the Sabbath day. The Sabbath is the only day that this should have happened. Now in verse 22, we're told that Jesus is passing through various towns and villages preaching, and someone asks him, Lord, will those who are saved be few? Before we read Jesus' response, we should consider what nature of Jesus' preaching that would cause someone in his audience to ask this question. This question implies that Jesus was not teaching that coming into the kingdom of God was something easy. If all that Jesus is teaching is mere confession or prayer, then this question does not make any sense. However, Jesus must be teaching about the difficult nature of coming into his kingdom, which will lead someone to ask this question. So let's look at how Jesus answers this direct question. Will few be saved? Verse 24, Jesus' answer is with three images to show the nature of the entrance into his kingdom. The first word that Jesus says is strive. Now the NIV or the Christian Standard Bible have make every effort. The New Living Translation has work hard. The New English Translation reads exert every effort. These translations capture the idea of the Greek word. In fact, one lexicon says that this Greek word means to fight or to struggle. Of, of this verse in total, strain every nerve to enter. The idea here is that Jesus says, strive to enter through the narrow door. Just make it your best effort. We cannot just easily stroll through this door to enter his kingdom and receive salvation. Entering the kingdom of salvation requires strength of will and a struggle to follow Jesus on the path of discipleship. The reason the door is narrow is not to keep us out, but to cause us to recognize that most will not accept his terms. Finding salvation requires more concentrated effort than most people are willing to put forth. Jesus does not say that being his disciple and entering into his kingdom is easy. You can't hit the easy button here. The door to enter to receive salvation is narrow. The door to dwell in his kingdom is narrow. Exerting every effort is required of us. There's nothing passive on our end. The third image is that many will seek to enter, but will not be able to enter. Verse 25 contains a short parable of the master of the house shutting the door and being unable to enter. Wanting to enter is just not enough. Earnest effort is required. Entry occurs on God's terms, not ours. Further, there is no automatic entry. The striving that Jesus speaks of is not a metaphor for baptism here. Jesus is not saying that you must strive to be baptized and then you are in the kingdom. This is a constant striving here. This is not a point in time when you believe in Jesus, repented of your sins, confessed him as the Son of God, and then was baptized, and that's it. Now you've entered through the narrow gate. No, 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 no. No, those who enter through the narrow door continually exert every effort to enter. Notice that these people want to enter. Jesus says they will seek to enter. In the parable, the people are knocking on the door and asking for the Lord to open up. Just because we want in the kingdom does not mean we are in the kingdom. Now, the master of the house says that he does not know where these people who are knocking on the door come from. The point is that you do not belong in this kingdom. The master does not know who you are or where you are from. You have no relationship with the master or he would open the door. Now, the people think they do have a relationship with the master. Notice their response. We ate and drank in your presence and you taught in our streets. They are saying that they know him. We ate with you and drank with you. You came into our city and taught in our streets. Yet the master repeats the same words. I do not know where you come from. We do not have a relationship. 
You may have heard of me. You may think you know me, but I don't know you. These words will surely sound familiar on the day of judgment. We sat in your pews. We heard your word. We went to church. But you did not go through the door. You may think you have a relationship with him, but proximity to Jesus is not enough. It's not enough to say you went to church. It's not enough to say you spent some time with Jesus. Jesus is not looking for a casual relationship. He does not know what that is. People who are in his kingdom are those who are striving to enter through the narrow door. The master continues, Depart from me, all you workers of evil. There are only two camps. Either we're working to enter through the narrow door, or we are working in evil. Jesus does not offer us a third choice. You're either working for him, or you're working for yourself which means you are working for Satan. Can I say here as well that eternal punishment is not being in the kingdom, the eternal kingdom of God? There's no other alternative. Either we are in the eternal kingdom of God or we're choosing eternal punishment. Just listen to the description that Jesus gives of hell, this eternal punishment, verse 28. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is a common description that Jesus gives of hell. The point is that this is not a place you want to go. Notice in this text that the anguish that comes from knowing on what you missed out on. You'll see Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, but you, you were cast down. The exchange is not worth it. Now, you don't have to strive for the kingdom of God. You don't have to make every effort and exert yourself to enter the kingdom of God. But understand, you'll be cast out to a place where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. Folks, that's not a good trade. Living for yourself now for, what, maybe 80 years so that you can live in punishment for eternity? Not a good exchange. The giving of ourselves to enter the kingdom of God is worth it. Verse 29 describes people coming from the east and the west. All peoples have the opportunity to receive salvation and enter the kingdom of God. Make every effort to enter, and you'll be one of those who are reclining at the banquet in the kingdom of God. Consider the contrast here that we see weeping and gnashing of teeth, or reclining at the table for a banquet. The choice is clear. Yet too often we are unwilling to make the sacrifice and dedicate ourselves to making every effort so we can belong to that great feast. Verse 30 is a surprising teaching by Jesus to, these, to this Jewish audience. Many of the Jews in the first century were rejecting his message. Though these that Jesus had come to save are rejecting the salvation message refusing to enter the kingdom of salvation. They are the first, but they will not be the last. That is, the message of salvation and the kingdom first came to them, but they will not enter because of their refusal to strive to enter. The last are the Gentiles, who receive the message of salvation and the kingdom the last of all, but they will strive to enter. They will participate in the feast of the Messiah. Those who seem close to the kingdom can be very far away, and those who seem far away from the kingdom may be closer to entering than you think. The Jews would have thought they were all in the kingdom, and the Gentiles were not. However, Jesus says the Gentiles are going to enter, while the Jews will not. Funerals are a sad occasion. They're sad because so many are comforted by false hope. Someone stands up and preaches about this person and how they've gone to heaven, even when that person gave absolutely no effort or care for the kingdom of God. Foolish things are said at funerals like, this person's gone to a better place. Most have not gone to a better place. The door is narrow. If they did not strive to enter through the narrow door, they do not inherit eternal life simply because they died. Folks, we are not entering through to salvation if we are not making every effort. The words against Jerusalem in verse 34 are true words for us today. Jesus is trying to bring you into his kingdom. He came to bring us the hope of restoration. He established his kingdom and offers salvation for our sins. Yet we refuse to be gathered into our Lord. We do not want to make the effort. We are unwilling to trade the giving of our physical life to gain eternal life. Knowing about God is not enough. Sitting in the pews is not enough. Being baptized is not enough. Believing in Jesus is not enough. Strive to enter through the narrow door. You will be saved. Many will not accept Jesus' turn. Be saved and enter through the door. As Jesus says, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Well, that concludes chapter 13. Next time, Luke chapter 14. Thank you so much.
Have a great and wonderful day. Happy